Dear friends and colleagues, it is a pleasure to send this message to you today on the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. As with so many elements of our lives, to be opposed to nuclear weapons is often portrayed as somehow or other uh, extreme, far out, not part of mainstream thinking, and not serious about security and defense. In fact, uh, the very opposite is the case. Those of us that want to live and see a secure world do so because we believe you have to look at the reasons for insecurity across the world. Mother, do you think they'll drop the bomb? Mother, do you think they'll like the song? I would now like to invite our next panelist, Reverend Emma Jordan Simpson, Executive Director of the Fellowship for Reconciliation USA. You have the floor. Good day, good day to all. I'm so pleased to be among uh, such a distinguished group of speakers who I know in their everyday lives are committed to peace and justice. And as the executive director of the US branch of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, I am here to join in this commemoration of the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, because we have for over 100 years with branches across the world and chapters and allies here at home in the US work to secure peace and to promote a vision of what we have called the beloved community, a vision of human, of human security. As we were organizing nonviolent resistance during the first and second world wars and protesting the war in Vietnam and initiating nuclear freeze campaigns, we were also doing our very best to live into this vision of beloved community. And so I want to lift the names of our member Thich Nhat Hanh and the Reverend James Lawson. And I wanna express gratitude for the spirit of our late member, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who left us a legacy that still challenges us to choose people and to choose life over death and war. The Fellowship of Reconciliation supports the aims of this commemoration, which are to raise public awareness about the threat posed to humanity by nuclear weapons and the absolute necessity for their total elimination. I speak as a citizen of the United States, but I also consider myself to be a citizen of the world. The only times nuclear weapons have been used in war have been the times that we they were used by my country, the United States. In 1945, the United States dropped a bomb on the city of Hiroshima, killing thousands of people. And the deaths from that act continue to mount as more people died from the radiation in the months after. A few days after we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, we did the same on Nagasaki, killing thousands more people. This was the line of demarcation, the breach in human history, the breach in human behavior that the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons hoped to repair. Those days in 1945 were world changing and that violence and its promise of destruction reverberates today in the real threat of mutually assured destruction as nine countries now have nuclear weapons. There are some 1400 nuclear weapons in the world's stockpiles now. And just using a small fraction of those weapons could destroy the entire world. And so as I sit here today and participate in this commemoration, I'm thinking about the 26 major corporations that lobby to produce more nuclear weapons and the 382 banks 
and insurance companies and pension funds and asset managers who are investing in these stockpiles. And I wanna ask them, what good are your riches to a destroyed world that no one, not even you can enjoy? As we commemorate this day, I'm also thinking about how different the world was just one year ago. This time last year, the planet was not hunkered down, not physically distanced, wearing masks and mourning the deaths of nearly 1 million people from a global pandemic. We have in the last six months alone been tragically reminded of why we must in the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, awaken from the illusion of our separateness. And so campaigns like this one are so intimately connected, I think, to a much deeper illness in our society. Not the illness caused by a virus, but the illness caused by a crisis of care. I refer to what Andreas Chatsidas, Jamie Hakim, Joe Littler, Catherine Rotberg, and Lynn Segal call the crisis that results from decades of policies that have prioritized profits over people, investments in weapon, weapons and warring, and disinvestments in the social capacity and practice involving the nurturing of all that is necessary for the welfare and the flourishing of human life. Nuclear weapons, in fact, no weapons are necessary for the nurture and flourishing of human life. There are no weapons that are necessary for the flourishing and nurture of human life. And life only flourishes when investments are made in human security, not security through the buildup of nuclear arsenals. Calling for the total elimination of nuclear weapons is indeed a necessary step. But as an American, I declare that it is also essential to the health and the future of the American soul. And that's what greatly concerns me today. Eliminating weapons of mass destruction do not eliminate the hallucinatory instincts that enable us to create these weapons in the first place. The United States is the arsenal that supplies the world with the lethal equipment necessary to participate in our hallucination and in the world's ultimate decimation. This hallucination has domestic and international components, and they are two sides of the same coin. Internationally, we create the specter of fear. We stir up the specter of fear, foreign terrorism. And we do that to justify the vast sums of money that we invest in our nuclear arsenal in our military preparedness, all to give ourselves an illusion of safety, but really to the benefit of an entire industry that is profiting off death and war. Yet what we spend on the illusions of safety through weapons could, be, could transform the conditions and the lives, not just for ourselves here in the United States, but for people across the world if we invested in human safety and security, if we dealt with our crisis of care. In the Uni United States, that fear is promoted as this perceived threat to our American identity, the founding myth of American exceptionalism, as if it is our right to police, the entire world. Domestically, fear is manifested and perceived through this, um, this, 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 this myth of American exceptionalism. And it is a myth. 
it's a myth grounded in the erasure of the genocide perpetrated against native peoples for their land, for their land and a free market capitalist economy built with the free label, labor of my people, of enslaved African-Americans. It's this kind of thinking that created nuclear weapons and created the buildup internationally, a race that we started generations ago and stoked by being the only nation to actually use these weapons twice. We have essentially militarized our policing in response to the perceived threat of this sacred American Genesis story, which is a myth. We've overindulged uh, an irrational fear of violence that can only be assuaged by massive overcompensation of the threat of violence. What I want to say as an African-American woman, a black woman, a, a citizen of the United States, but also a citizen of the world, is that I want more for the world than just the total elimination of nuclear weapons. And I use the passion, the grief that I feel for the murder of a black woman in this country to frame this desire to want more. I call the name of Breonna Taylor, who was killed by police in Louisville, Kentucky as she slept in her bed. Her family wants justice for her, her friends, her community want justice for her and they're calling for the arrest of the officers and that is just and that is right. But I want more, we want more for her. Justice is not the arrest, just the arrest of these officers. Justice is for Breonna Taylor to be alive. And so the system that we keep fighting against was never intended to deliver justice for us for any of us. It is dependent upon the incredible investments in new toys and new weapons. And those new toys and new weapons are always directed on poor communities and on people of color, on people like me. They cannot deliver justice. And so I call on the United States, yes, to participate in this call for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. But I call on us, I challenge us to begin this effort at home with the abolition of policing. We see the abolition of nuclear weapons beginning at home with the abolition, not just of militarized policing, but policing itself. The abolition of structures of violence and inequity Let's stop investing in structures of violence and inequity and the wholesale investment in that which nourishes, nourishes life for all people. I want us to be cured of our crisis of care. I'm very happy to be the executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And in the name of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Congressman John Lewis, Mahatma Gandhi, Thich Nhat Hanh, and countless others who have walked with four for over, past, over the past century, I ask us to all, I ask us, I ask everyone to consider that the total elimination of nuclear weapons is the equivalent of removing a particularly virulent tumor. It's an important step, but it does nothing to cure the underlying cancer that is ravaging our body politic. I call for us to see each other as human beings. And I call for us to see this world as the world that we're called on to take care of. I call us to care that what happens to one person on one continent matters absolutely to everyone in the world. If we've learned nothing from these, these past six months, 
we have to learn our weapons, no matter how powerful they are, are nothing compared to a virus that will attack us all that we will not acknowledge. So yes, let us use this day to call on the, the total elimination of nuclear weapons, but let us also seek the cure for our crisis of care. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks and for asking the very important question. What good are riches in a destroyed world? And you're right, absolutely no weapons are necessary for the nourishment and flourishing of life. And what happens in one, to one person in one continent definitely affects someone in another part of the world. So I thank you for your remarks. We have time for one question uh, from William Thomas who asks, Weapons makers see great profits in producing such weapons of mass destruction. In the U.S., this military complex has immense power and influence over the top elected officials. How can we, the people of not just the U.S., lessen or end the influence of this complex? Uh, thank you for that question. I think first we have to educate ourselves on how much uh, money from the nuclear weapons industry drives American politics. I don't think that there are enough people in the United States uh, uh, who understand just how money drives um, this, this race. And so for the, the, the first thing that we have to do is educate ourselves about it. There are wonderful uh, organizations and uh, campaigns and efforts. Um, you, uh, stop the nuclear, uh, move the nuclear weapons money. Uh, there's one, a, a link in the chat, nuclear, um, the chat, nuclearweaponsmoney.org. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is to educate ourselves. Because when we know what our own elected officials, our local elected officials are doing and why it is that they vote the way that they vote and the money that is used to fund their campaigns, then we will act differently because this is not, this is not just um, a threat uh, um, that, you know, it, it's sort of like a, a, a theoretical one. This is a real threat that, you know, engages the poorest people in our society as the foot soldiers while those who are at the top of the society benefit from the riches uh, derived thereof. So if you need to, uh, we need to all ask ourselves of our own elected officials, how are their campaigns funded? That's the first thing that we can do. Thank you once again, and you're right. We need to educate ourselves and that's why disarmament education is so important. Something which my organization wholeheartedly supports and tries to implement on a daily basis. I thank you once again.